1998 as the government's senior policy advisor to the Minister of the Environment, Elizabeth May helped to create five new national parks to develop the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, and work diligently to negotiate the Montreal Protocol to protect our precious ozone layer. And from 1989 to 2006, as the Executive Director of Sierra Club of Canada, Elizabeth May was at the forefront in helping those families who were affected by the government's inexcusable failure to clean up the city tar ponds at Cape Breton's. And under her leadership, the Sierra Club of Canada expanded from two to five chapters all over Canada, and the National Sierra Youth Coalition was also established. And in, on August 26, 2006, Elizabeth May was elected as a leader of the Green Party of Canada by a landslide victory uh, on the first ballot. Now, aside from her many other honors and awards, Elizabeth May was also appointed an officer of the prestigious Order of Canada for her tremendous work, both nationally and internationally, uh, in sustainable development and in protection of global ecosystems. Now you're all here to hear her speak and not I, so without further ado, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to the leader of the Green Party of Canada and hopefully the next Member of Parliament for Central Nova, Ms. Elizabeth May. Thanks, Anthony. I hope you don't mind if I'm standing behind here. I, eight weeks ago, had a full hip replacement, and if every now and then I just need to put my weight on something to stay stable, I'm pretty secure right now. I'm very happy to have a new hip thanks to our healthcare system, but I think this is a a good spot. Um, thank Anthony for a very enthusiastic introduction. I'm very grateful and glad to have a chance to talk to all of you who have taken time out of your day to, to come. I don't know how many of you are here because of primary interest in the climate crisis and how many are here because you're interested in the Green Party in general. I, I've chosen to direct my remarks this afternoon primarily to the climate issue and not necessarily in such a partisan fashion as you might expect. We're on the verge of a major United Nations negotiation, and I think it's important to have the citizenry that's concerned about these issues as informed as possible, as aware of what's happening. And I'm very, very comfortable shifting it to a more partisan focus, if that's uh, more what you were hoping to hear. I, I wanted to direct your attention to the full Green Party, uh, basically a policy foundational statement that we released in Ottawa the day before Stephen Harper uh, had the new speech from the throne of the federal government. So if you are interested in policies of the Green Party across a broad swath of everything from foreign policies and overseas development assistance to reforming the criminal justice system to what we would do about health care to preventing cancer-causing chemicals from being in our food system and in our ecosystems right through to uh, open software access and what we would do about the tax system on, uh, for middle income families and the middle class. These are all policies you'll find here. But I wanted to address today the, this question of are we, are we running on empty? In other words, are we facing, a lot of people are very concerned, quite rightly, about peak oil, which is clearly, uh, if it hasn't already occurred, it's certainly coming. But the more fundamental question, are we running out of time? And this is in the context of the upcoming Bali meetings and some of the more recent reports from the international community from two really large bodies, the International Energy Agency and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So I want to address those and I'll take about half an hour or so, maybe 40 minutes, and then take your questions on anything and hope that that provides enough of a framework for what you're looking for to answer uh, you're, if you're here because you want to know what the Green Party stands for, feel free to throw those questions at me, even though this lecture is primarily directed at the more fundamental questions of where we are on this planet in relation to the climate crisis. By the way, I'm really pleased to have Dan Bryce come and be here today, and I'm really excited about his campaign here in Quadra, so I just want to underscore his invitation that if you want to get involved, uh, being a supporter of the Green Party here in Quadra can be very exciting. And I would urge you to uh, let him know if you're interested in helping out. Well, look, I'm just going to back up for a bit, way back, and explain to you how I got involved in the climate issue. I've been working on the issue of the climate, the climate change issue, shall we say, um, since 1986. 
So what is that now, 21 years? And it's because of, of something very specific. I was, as you heard in Anthony's introduction, senior policy advisor at the Office of the Federal Minister of Environment in the Mulroney years. Now, this may be so counterintuitive, you can hardly believe it, for those of you who didn't live through that era, uh, but in, we were actually, as a, as a nation, in the lead on a lot of environmental issues in the 80s. We actually took uh, steps and confronted major environmental threats, even with Brian Mulroney, who you may recall, stood arm in arm with Ronald Reagan, singing When Irish Eyes Are Smiling, but we did know how to take them on and disagree on an issue like acid rain, where Canada under Brian Mulroney uh, made acid rain the top bilateral issue when he'd sit down with the U.S. president and not accept their view of the world. It was easy not to accept Ronald Reagan's view of the world. He once said that acid rain was caused by ducks. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, our science said otherwise. Uh, so we were confronting the issue of sulfur dioxide emissions, of the fact that we now had an environmental problem that transcended the local problem of bad air quality, which in the 1960s had led to ambient air standards that, were, that was you know, basically clean up the air right around your factory. The solution to that, way back when, the motto was the solution to pollution is dilution. So, higher smokestacks to take all the pollution from, say, a local smelter and get it out of the local neighborhood, into other currents, take it farther away, where guess what? It uh, fell as acid rain. So the, the, the shift from sulfur dioxide to sulfuric acid to acid rain all happened in the context of a solution to local air quality issues. But we didn't just let it happen. Canadian lakes and rivers were dying. Canadian forests were experiencing dieback conditions. We negotiated, we got a 50% reduction in the pollution that causes acid rain in a bilateral agreement with the United States, and we negotiated it at the federal government level with the seven eastern provinces. We actually set targets and met them, can you imagine? So it was in that context when I started working in the federal government that I learned about climate science from the government of Canada scientists working in Environment Canada. So this is, again, more than 20 years ago. And the science was already very clear that as we burned more fossil fuels, we were adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a, is a profound warming gas, as are other greenhouse gases. Uh, unit per unit, methane is worse, but there's a lot more CO2 going into the atmosphere than methane. So we started looking at this issue, and I can remember the briefings, and I promise you, Environment Canada scientists were never trained to be excited. Uh, a briefing from your scientific staff to the Minister of Environment was, I, I think, perhaps designed to be soporific, but something like this room. But the, the impact for me as an environmental activist who come through the fights against pesticide spraying, as you've heard, who worked on issues like trying to stop nuclear power plants from coming in, worked against uranium mining, I had a lot of experience at the grassroots level working on issues where the link was really clear between human health and the environment. And here I was getting briefings that I, really hadn't realized how the climate change threat really trumped everything else I'd ever worked on as the biggest threat we were facing. So I helped organize with the uh, government. I was in charge for the minister's staff of a major global scientific conference, which was called Our Changing Atmosphere Implications for Global Security. It was the first large global scientific conference on the climate issue. It took place in June 1988 in Toronto, and that was at that point the largest international gathering. There had been lots of other meetings of scientists internationally, and a former president at that point, U.S. President Jimmy Carter, had commissioned the U.S. National Academy of Science to look at the issue, and they concluded that we could, we, in the near future, start changing the climate's atmosphere from changing, cha changing the, the, the uh, planet's climate by changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. So there had been some good science, but this was a major kind of threshold event. Stephen Schneider from Colorado, who'd been doing a lot of the uh, CO2 readings uh, in, globally at the time, he said, gee, this is sort of like, for a scientist, this is like Woodstock. I mean, it was a lot of people gathered together for the first time looking at the issue. And I go back to 1988 quite often because we've seen a lot of effort to educate people about the climate crisis since then. 
We've had Al Gore win the Nobel Peace Prize this year in conjunction, by the way, with another body I'll talk about in a minute, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But for my money, the clearest exposition of the threat was that which was issued in the consensus statement of the scientists who were gathered in Toronto in June 88. This was a conference that was hosted by the government of Canada, opened by Brian Mulroney and then Prime Minister of Norway, Bruce Harlan Brundtland. It was a high level event. And what the scientists that gathered there said in the first sentence of their consensus statement was this, very clear description of the nature of the problem. They wrote, humanity is conducting an unintended, uncontrolled, globally pervasive experiment whose ultimate consequences are second only to global nuclear war. Now, you can, that's, what, that's the science we had 21 years ago. And the science since then has done nothing but get more robust, clearer. We've answered a lot of the question marks. And the big question mark back in June 88, by the way, was uh, we were holding the conference in Toronto, as I mentioned, and there was a stunning heat wave in progress. So the question on people's minds was, is this a climate event now that we're having these kinds of temperatures in Toronto in late June, or is this just a blip? In other words, is the climate change signal rising above the noise of background effects? I mean, there were scientists at that conference who were split. Now nobody would be split. We're clearly seeing climate change impacts. We're clearly seeing that the human foot fingerprints are all over serious climate events globally. So back in 88, one of the things that happened as a result of that conference was that the United Nations system began to organize around what do we do about the climate crisis. Uh, at this point, by the way, not only had we dealt with acid rain as a threat, we dealt with the threat to the ozone layer. As Anthony mentioned, we negotiated the Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone layer in uh, September of 1987 to successful conclusion. And I'll come back to that in a minute, too, because it bears a direct relevance to the way Kyoto is structured and the way it's organized. So the UN response to the threat of climate change, one of the first things they did, and this is unprecedented for any issue globally, was they created a scientific peer review body drawing on scientists from around the world. So in 1988, the United Nations system created the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and it has been providing periodic reviews of all the scientific literature that's published anywhere. It's all peer-reviewed literature, and the best scientists in the world review it, and they try to put it into language that a policymaker slash politician can understand. And that's been the challenge of the IPCC. They've now issued four consensus reports, and most recently, they provided an update from their meeting in Spain. So let me fast forward through all the negotiations and tell you exactly where we are right now. Uh, just a little bit over 10 days from now, on December 3rd, uh, the United Nations system will be meeting in Indonesia under the Kyoto Protocol to negotiate the next round of emission reduction targets. This is a really critical session. It is not the first. You need to bear in mind that the, uh, the, the international negotiating process that I mentioned kind of launched in 88 culminated initially in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that is the umbrella treaty within which everything else is being negotiated. And 180 nations around the world signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Climate Change. As a matter of fact, Canada was the first industrialized country to both sign and ratify, did both within the calendar year of 1992 committing ourselves to reduce emissions to avoid levels that would become dangerous in the atmosphere. Within the Framework Convention on Climate Change, if there is a process, it's almost like having its own mini parliament, and that's what's continuing in, in Indonesia December 3rd. Every country that signs and ratifies a treaty is called a party to that treaty. So every year, the members of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the parties to the convention, meet in a large session and they're called the Conference of the Parties, or COP. And this uh, next week in Indonesia will be COP 12. COP 10 was the one that was in Montreal in December, November, December 2005. Some of you may remember it. Unfortunately for, for Canada, on uh, November 28th, the opening day of that conference, the government fell and we were into an election which meant a couple of things. One, it nearly scuttled the negotiations. We were fortunate that, it, that they didn't uh, get lost 
where Canadian politicians wouldn't be able to actually deliver on Canadian negotiations. And the president of the COP, by the way, was Stéphane Dion. But that's another story. That was, was his commitment to stick it out and do the negotiations and not pay attention to the fact that there was an election, which, as you know, I've, I've spoken uh, well, I've spoken honestly about the fact I respect him, and that was why. He, he didn't get distracted by the election. He steered through some very difficult negotiations. But that was the 10th Conference of the Parties, and it was also, by the way, the first meeting of the parties under Kyoto. So while the Framework Convention has COPs, the Kyoto Protocol has MOPs. And just to let you know, UN language sometimes drives you nuts. The meetings of the parties, again, the 165 nations that have signed and ratified Kyoto also have their own kind of mini parliament process. And those are called the meetings of the parties. So Indonesia next week is basically COP12 and MOP3. And the Kyoto Protocol is not dead. The fact that Canada is ignoring our international and legally binding commitments brings shame to our country. But I want to speak in the larger context of what the scientists are advising negotiators there to deal with and why it really matters that we focus on reducing emissions. We've had a lot of, of scientific advice through the IPCC and through all the work they peer review. And we also have a lot of interest in fossil fuels, as I mentioned, from peak oil concerns for geopolitical concerns, that maintaining uh, armed forces, I mean, the US invasion of Iraq was more about oil. It clearly wasn't about weapons of mass destruction that weren't there. Uh, we know that maintaining a, a, a dependency, or as George Bush has described it, the US addiction to oil has a high price, ecologically, but also in geopolitical terms and in military terms. And there's the concern, which is quite right, if you don't know what I mean when I talk about peak oil, be the point at which, uh, in Hubbard's estimation, there'd be a peak at which you were you could not find as much new oil as you needed. You found basically what there was, and you began to see declining supplies. A lot of people believe we've already hit that peak moment. It doesn't mean we've run out of oil yet. It does mean that, of course, it's a non-renewable resource. We will run out eventually. But trumping all of these, I think, is that threat that we've already, regardless of when we run out of fossil fuels, because even when we run out of oil, unfortunately, we've still got a lot of coal. But even when we run out of oil, we still will see, uh, before we can run out of oil, that we've already run out of space in the atmosphere for the emissions from greenhouse gases. Now, the two recent reports that came out that I wanted to talk about, one was the World Energy Outlook. It came out first. It's the International Energy Agency, and usually the International Energy Agency find these reports, they're not basically an environmental think tank. They're not an environmental body. They're not, they're not like the IPCC. The International Energy Agency looks at supply questions, looks at demand questions, and reports on that. And this year, the report was basically about the threat of the climate crisis. They looked at the ongoing increasing demand for energy. They said that on current projections, the current trends will ensure that by the year 2030, if we continue as we now are with the programs that are now in place, greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 will be 27% higher than they were in 2005. If we allow current trends to continue, the World uh, Energy Outlook of the IEA says that the effect will be an unavoidable temperature increase on the basis of global average temperature increase of three degrees Celsius. Now, I just want to put this in some context. I'm sorry that there's so many numbers and I have to go back and forth between where we are and what it means. What it means is this. That it doesn't sound like a lot, three degrees Celsius. In Canada, we live through very, very cold winters and very hot summers, and three degrees sounds trivial. The difference in average global temperatures today versus average global temperatures in the last ice age is five degrees. So that average global temperature conceals a lot of extremes, and a, a, a change of two to three degrees Celsius is huge. So again, the difference between the temperature on Earth today expressed as a global average temperature and the temperature on Earth in the last ice age is five degrees. So if we on current trends allow temperature to increase by three degrees Celsius, what does that mean? Well, again, the scientific consensus on this is quite clear from that other body I mentioned, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If we hit three degrees, we're committed to four degrees. If we hit four degrees, we're committed to five degrees, and so on. 
In other words, we hit a place of what some scientists are calling the point of no return, the runaway greenhouse effect that can't be stopped, where even if we went cold turkey and gave up all our fossil fuel habits, it wouldn't make any difference because we will have unleashed so many climate changes that they themselves perpetuate the climate crisis. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term feedback loops. I know that Al Gore's film talks about feedback loops. But, for instance, when a forest is drier because of the climate crisis, when we have more forest fires, forests burn release more carbon, creating more warming conditions to have drier conditions, to have more forest fires to release more carbon. Same kind of feedback loop can be described in the, in the, North, the North Pole and the Arctic. Our ice cap is shrinking. I'm sure you all know that. Warmer ocean water is causing Arctic ice to shrink. Now, one of the reasons that that creates a feedback loop is that the ice cap itself helps resist warming. When the sun's radiation strikes ice being white, it bounces off. That's, you know, uh, white will not absorb heat, it will repel heat. That's why we wear white clothes in summer. Uh, is your basic reality. So when your solar radiation strikes the ice, it bounces off to space a great deal of it. As the ice shrinks, solar radiation hits the ocean water, which is basically dark, and absorbs that solar radiation, thus heating the ocean temperature more, leading to faster retreat of the ice cap, leading to more ocean water being exposed, leading to more heating. And the last of these feedback loops I'll describe, there are others, is another one from the Arctic, which is melting permafrost. I mentioned earlier that methane is unit for unit a more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. Permafrost is permanently frozen organic material containing a lot of methane. And as it melts and subsides because of climate change, the western Arctic of Canada and Siberia are experiencing quite dramatic permafrost melt. As permafrost melts, it releases methane, powerful greenhouse gas that's being the warming. So that's why avoiding those points of no return, those tipping points in the atmosphere, are so critical. And why the scenario the World Energy Outlook describes is one we can't, we can't adopt this as a plan. Current trends are not acceptable. Bottom line, we cannot likely survive, human civilization cannot likely survive the kind of climate impacts we will see globally if we let current trends be our direction. We have to reverse current trends and fight quite dramatically, quite rapidly. How rapidly? Well, to avoid hitting two degrees Celsius, to avoid a tipping point event, we need to hold CO2 emissions on the planet low. We need to avoid concentrations of carbon dioxide exceeding 450 parts per million. I, I hate doing this, but I'm going to use the chalkboard. I just hate doing it because it looks too teacherish, but i got to do it. I'm throwing too many numbers at you, and it's just enough. It's, I'm just going to write down a few base points. Up until uh, the Industrial Revolution, these carbon dioxide concentrations on planet Earth were generally never above, well, they were never above, not just generally, they were never above 280 parts per million. They tend to be described more often as 275 parts per million because that's where they were most often before the Industrial Revolution, but never above 280 parts per million. When I say never, how long is never? Well, we have really good science on this from Antarctic ice core drilling. And when you drill in the Antarctic ice core, they're able to date when the ice was formed. So they know when a piece of ice is um, 500 years old, 2,000 years old, 20,000 years old, 650,000 years old, right? At every little air bubble in that ice that was formed in those different time periods is like a time capsule of the planet's chemistry in our atmosphere. That's how we know with precision, based on accurate measurements in this century, what the chemistry of our atmosphere was like going back a very, very long period of time, a period of time that quite eclipses all the time of human civilization. So we know that over the last 650,000 years, CO2 concentrations never went above 280 parts per million. They're now more than 30% higher. They're about 384 parts per million. And what we want to avoid is allowing them to hit 450. 
If they hit 450, we become committed to 2 degrees Celsius, which leads us to 3 degrees and so on. That's why the, inter the, uh, the International Energy Agency said that in order to hold them here, we must ensure globally that the peak level of greenhouse gases emitted to the atmosphere occurs in 2015 and starts dropping after that. Because we have to stabilize first, stop the growth in emissions, and start driving them down no later than 2015 or eight years from now, seven to eight years from now. That's a tall order, and we have to do it globally. It can be done, and I say it can be done because I know it must be done. That's going to be the challenge of what they're looking at at the UN conference when it opens in Bali, Indonesia. They're looking at what do we do under the Kyoto Protocol in the next commitment period. You may remember that the first commitment period, the one that Canada is now committed to avoiding, we're committed to ignoring our targets under the Harper Doctrine, exists is between 2008 and 2012. To make this work, to have emissions reductions that work, we need to have a negotiated set of commitments that go back to capitals all around the world that can be ratified all around the world so that when 2012 is over and we move into 2013, we have a series of really tough emissions reductions targets that work. I mentioned I was going to come back to the Montreal Protocol. It's only to make this point. To deal with protecting the ozone layer, we did exactly what Kyoto did later on. We modeled Kyoto after the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol said rich countries go first. Industrialized nations reduce their use and, and manufacture fluorofluorocarbons first. Developing countries come on later. As a matter of fact, under the Montreal Protocol, developing countries could increase their use of ozone-depleting substances by 15%, while industrialized countries were committed to cut by 50%. So we had this notion of different treatments of the rich countries and the poor. There's a lot of reasons for this. It's equity. It's practicalities. If the wealthy countries of the world don't show they can do it, demonstrate the new technologies, how do developing countries then pick up on all that. So that's why Kyoto, in its first phase, 2008 to 2015, had 165 nations that had signed on, including China, India, and Brazil. But the negotiations never even intended to ask developing countries to participate in targets in the first phase. Anytime you hear somebody on CBC or read it in the newspaper, the reporter says India and China refuse to accept targets under Kyoto, that's just plain false because the architecture of negotiations from the very beginning never asked them to do so. Now we're asking because it's now we're moving into 2013 and emissions are going through the roof. And even though most of the Kyoto nations have met their target, Canada is the exception, not the rule. Uh, even though that has taken place, the U.S. walked away. And the U.S. was, until very recently, the world's biggest polluter. They've just, depending on the data, it looks like they've just been overtaken by China. But in 1980, 1997, when we negotiated Kyoto, the United States was 4% of the world's population, producing 25% of the greenhouse gases. The fact that China is now overtaking them is, is, uh, is worrying to say the least, but it's critical that they also join in the protocol in the next period. If I can just finish this, I get to question again. So where that leaves us is that we're on the brink of negotiations that do involve 165 nations around the world. The only countries of any consequence that didn't ratify Kyoto were Australia and the United States. As of tomorrow, the anti-Kyoto government of Australia, please God, the democracy and the polls and everything we're looking at works. John Howard will not be Prime Minister of Australia in the next minute period. Yes, this is good news. <laughs> I'd love to announce that the Greens are going to form government. The Greens will work well with Labour. It looks like they're going to form government. It's hard. I, I have a hard time not liking the Labour Party. Their climate critic is Peter Garrett, former lead singer of Midnight Oil. And one of my personal faves. Uh, so uh, he will be, I hope, playing a role in Bali, and John Howard will not. And the Australian Greens will work well with the Labour Party. because. And one reason Howard's likely to lose is because he's against Kyoto, and because Australia is in the grip of their eighth year of persistent drought. They are seriously affected by the climate crisis, and they are not impressed with their government's approach of joining with George Bush 
initially to deny there is a climate crisis, and then to insist that the solution to climate is more coal and nuclear, neither of which do Australians particularly believe as an argument. So the last point I want to make, and I think this is the critical one from which I drew the, the title of this talk, is the following conclusion of the World Energy Outlook. Uh, as I said, this is usually a document that tells us how we're doing on supplies of energy. And their conclusion is this. The primary scarcity facing the planet is not of natural resources nor money, but time. That's what we have to start wrapping our minds around. We're, it's not so critical that we might be out of oil soon. It's not a problem that we have economic challenges to meet our targets. The major issue we're facing is that we're running out of time. Because by 2015, we must globally see a stabilization of emissions from all nations and the beginning of the downward trend so that we can reduce emissions by about 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. Now for the political message. To do this in Canada, to have us play a constructive role in negotiations, we are way over time on having a government that is only pretending to be interested in the climate long enough to confuse the voters so that they can get back in. We don't have time for Stephen Harper as Prime Minister. We must have a change in government as quickly as possible so that Canada can stop playing the role we are now playing globally, which we will play in Bali, which makes me so ashamed of being a global saboteur, of undermining not only failing to meet our own domestic targets, that's bad, but what's more unforgivable is going into an international negotiation, working against progress of all nations, encouraging no nation to take on a hard target, arguing that all nations should accept fraudulent targets based on, I don't know if you know this concept, intensity targets invented by George Bush that you reduce not your total emissions, but your emissions per unit of production. So as the barrels of oil produced in the tar sands go up, emissions can increase while still saying we're meeting our targets. That's as much as I want to say off the top. I want to encourage all of you, regardless of whether you're interested in politics or the Green Party, assuming you're interested in the climate issue, to, to stay very alert to what goes on in the local press and in the national press over the coming weeks and months. Knowing that the Harper government is running a disinformation campaign, confusing people by announcing that they have a 20% target by 2020, sounds really good, same target as the European Union, so you realize the European Union is 20% reductions below 1990 levels, and Harper's talking about 20% below 2006 levels, which is not a trivial difference of a 24% increase between those base years. So we're dealing with a government that's bent on fraud, a fraud on the public and a fraud on future generations. We've run out of time. We have to be able, as citizen watchdogs, which I hope all of you will be, to pick up a pen or pick up your laptop and fire off letters to the editor when you see nonsense about this issue. To continue to inform yourselves and to demand that Canada play a constructive role in global negotiations and that we as a society demand that our government accept steep targets that we actually meet in the commitment period after 2012. Thanks very much.
mentioned uh, Manitoba and BC, I'd add them back to the list. And what Campbell's planning here, I, and then specifically a question on cap and trade. The Green Party is not opposed to cap and trade programs, but they have to be very tightly regulated and they have to be specific to certain industrial sectors and they're not enough by themselves. So our approach is set out here, starts with the fundamental that we need a carbon tax and that the, the revenues brought in from a carbon tax can be used to offset other taxes. So whenever anyone talks about a new tax, most people get all freaked out. But this would be a, a way of reducing income taxes and payroll taxes by, by having a tax on carbon that help to redress the fact that in the marketplace, the decisions that are, that are sound and sensible and sane and essential to reduce greenhouse gases are actually not right decisions from a business point of view because fossil fuels are, stu are still too cheap in the marketplace. Cap and trade is one element that we would also bring in, particularly around where it seems to make the most sense is in, for instance, capping the emissions from fossil fuel electrical generating stations. Then it's like apples and apples, you can compare and bring it down. So if one reduces emissions faster, they get the benefit and the other has to pay through the nose to pay for their emission reductions if they choose to. They still have to pay a carbon tax. They're not off the hook to a carbon tax. So it's not that they are in any way given a special deal, it's just to enhance and to uh, accelerate the emissions reductions because it gives them yet another market incentive to reduce emissions. It has to be very carefully monitored. There is room in cap and trade for what looks like fraud. Uh, and that's why it's very specific to certain sectors. We'd also bring in regulations on vehicle emissions, on appliances. We'd work with provinces to ensure they bring in the toughest uh, building standards for building codes to reduce emissions. And we also include in our program uh, a program to improve the existing housing and building stock. Part of the problem is where people think you can't make improvements is where they assume that, that basically your capital stock doesn't get retired to the end of its useful life. You can do a lot in a program that goes into, for instance, a university like this is full of leaks. You've got horrible lighting, you've got buildings that weren't insulated, thinking about the climate crisis, you probably have terrible furnaces. Uh, the nature of universities is they're struggling to stay afloat, which is another part of our platform, why universities need more money. Uh, but you need special funds to help get a university to be as energy efficient as possible. You're saving a lot of greenhouse gases. And when you start taking apart the economy in bite-sized chunks, you can start figuring out how we actually can reduce emissions. And it has zero negative economic impact. In, in fact, it's very positive because you're modernizing, reducing pollution, and you're also employing people particularly in something like retrofitting the buildings across Canada, building low-income housing that's energy efficient. All of these things are in our, in our approach. But we don't rule out a cap-and-trade system. We just don't think it's, the, it's a solution in and of itself, and it needs to be very carefully watched. And there's a hand way back there in the corner. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering how a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade uh, scheme would work with international trade. Uh, well, there, there are many countries already have carbon taxes with which we trade. Uh, so uh, many countries in Europe, in Norway put in place a carbon tax many years ago, and it's also, of course, a major oil exporter from the North Sea, oil. So these are things you can you just live with them domestically. And it's, a, it's a domestic decision where you put your taxes, and they work quite well. I mean, that's one reason that the European Union set Kyoto targets. It's, it's throughout the system, they've had a number of signals that make energy cost more. Uh, bottom line. And in Canada, we can do it in a way that reduces income taxes, reduces payroll taxes. So I don't think we'll have Canadians refusing to accept the fact that we need to put a price on energy. Uh, one of the interesting things about trade, though, is it's a very, uh, well, lively discussion in Europe with a lot of support that countries like Canada and the U.S., which are trading with them while in violation of our Kyoto commitments, should have trade sanctions against our exports because essentially our trade in manufactured goods represents a kind of a, a carbon crime and that's something we should be punished for. So we're much more at risk of trade sanctions by not living up to Kyoto than by putting in place the measures we need to put in place. Uh, and, and basically there are also carbon markets. Uh, there's a cap and trade system, by the way, um, in the New England states very similar to the one I described, it's dealing with the cap and trade to reduce emissions from the coal-fired power plants in the New England region. So the Northeast, it's called REGI, uh, the regional, I don't know if REGI, anyway, Northeast U.S., all the uh, coal-fired power plants have just started up. We'll see how well it's working.
but when it, 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 it has a lot of transactional costs compared to a tax, but ultimately it should operate like a tax. It, it puts the price on carbon above where it would normally be otherwise. It, so monetizing carbon, if I can put it that way, cap and trade and tax both do it, but you know, we can't treat the atmosphere as a free good, a free garbage dump for all of our atmospheric wastes, and that's what happens when we don't put a price on carbon. Yeah, um, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, curious to know a little bit more about the foreign policy analysis on the war um, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, I found it disconcerting today in the Global Mail when I read about uh, battle plans for Iran. And I want to know how this fits into your your um, uh, speech, which is great. Yeah, it's some, it's something we need to. Yeah. Well, this is. First of all, I should say, in case anyone doesn't know, the Green Party is a global party. I mentioned Greens in Australia. Uh, as a global party, we adhere to global principles, and one of them is that we're committed to, to peace and to finding cooperative solutions, and we're against, and, and against militarism. So the uh, actually, the German Greens, where they first took off, was more around issues of bringing an end to nuclear weapons than it was around what you could think of as the conventional environmental pollution issues. On Afghanistan, obviously we're, the war in Iraq is illegal. Uh, we issued a statement recently that we think resistors to an illegal war who come to Canada should be allowed to stay here. It's a very different situation than people who enlist in the war and then change their mind. I've had a lot of debates with uh, uh, online radio hosts, mostly in commercial radio, who say, well, it's like a contract. So a soldier signs up, they've made a contract to do this job, and if they don't like it once they get there, then we don't welcome them here because it's not like uh, in, the, in the Vietnam War when there was a draft. So people are trying to create this difference between the current situation of the war in Iraq, which just won't give the whole argument, but to me, any contract entered into on the basis of fraud, I mean, I went to law school. So uh, contracts entered into on the basis of fraud are void ab initio, and the war in Iraq was entered into based on massive fraud, uh, where George Bush essentially concocted an argument that Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11, or with Al-Qaeda, or that there were weapons of mass destruction. None of these things were true. And the US administration, I'm not sure George Bush knew them because he wasn't really in charge at the time. It was uh, Cheney and Karl Rove and all the other, um, and Rumsfeld and his, you know, the gang of people who liked George Bush to do the talking for them. God only knows why, because he actually can't talk. But, uh, <laughs> well, say whatever you tell him, though. Yeah, he, yeah. So anyway, the, they knew at the time that what they were telling people was a lie. So soldiers who found themselves uh, in a situation pursuing an illegal war against a country that had not participated in the attacks of 9-11 and then decided that they wanted to, to, to leave that out of conscience, we think should be welcome to Canada. Uh, now to Afghanistan. Our policy on Afghanistan is that there are good reasons for Canada to be there. There were sensible reasons for us to be involved initially in the context of our commitment to green values, that this con these people, that particularly uh, a society that's gone through the wars they've been through, that had been through the abuse of human rights, the Taliban not allowing women and girls to have any kind of education, that that society needed help rebuilding. So a peacekeeping effort, a rebuilding effort is one that we think is sensible. It was not illegal. It had a United Nations approval going in. What's happened is since then, uh, certainly with Stephen Harper, his first foreign trip after becoming prime minister was to go to Kandahar, land on the tarmac, and say that uh, Canada didn't cut and run, and we were here as, the war, as part of the war against terrorism. That profoundly redefined the mission. We've since been involved in counterinsurgency measures against the Taliban, it doesn't have, NATO doesn't have a strategic objective that's clear, and if it does have a strategic objective, it's not reaching it. We think that the NATO mission should not be supported, and that Canada's role in Afghanistan should be within the United Nations context, and frankly, the, we, the, the mission in Afghanistan would be safer, make more sense, and have more policy coherence if the U.S. wasn't involved. The U.S. role in Afghanistan is so contaminated by their previous role in, in funding Islamic extremists in order to get rid of the Soviets, that their motives there contaminate what we're doing in peacekeeping. So if we had a United Nations force with more nations from, uh, from Islamic countries participating, more soldiers from Islamic countries participating in peacekeeping, we could get away from the idea that, that frankly, that Bush and the Islamic extremists like to perpetuate that this is a clash of civilizations, Christian West versus Islam. And we also believe that it's quite wrong-headed, as the Canadian forces actually advise NATO, 
wrong idea to destroy the poppy crops. It's, it, it's the livelihood of so many poppy farmers. We've adopted what the Sandalist Council recommends, which is the poppy crop should be tightly regulated, controlled, and harvested for medicinal use. And we also, um, we believe that what, uh, what Canada is doing in Afghanistan only makes sense in the context of a broader initiative for rebuilding civil society and assisting not just in southern Afghanistan, but there are 23 northern states where nothing is happening except for small NGOs trying to help. So the mission is wrong, and we need to deal with the whole, now we've got Pakistan in a quite unstable situation. But the Taliban is not in disarray. You saw that report probably today from, uh, from the Senate's Council. The uh, this NATO mission is failing against any objective one might want to set for it. And Canada's ongoing participation should not be in a NATO aggressive force in southern Afghanistan. And we shouldn't wait till some date in the future, like February 2009, to say so. So that's where we are. I know it's a long, complicated answer, and I even skipped some of the complexities of our position. But it's on our website. Yeah, right up front there. I, I wanted to start by saying that I read the policy on climate change and I'm really, really impressed. Um, so I have a question just about um, people often associate these environmental initiatives with increasing all of them. But in fact, a lot of it's about leveling the playing field. For example, removing subsidies on oil companies and having people who don't drive a car pay for people who drive. And um, I'm wondering how much do you focus on that when you talk to people like you know, average show kind of about leveling the playing field and whether people relate to that kind of thing. I'm going to repeat that. I'm assuming people couldn't hear that across the room. The question of the assumption that people make that if there's a good climate change plan, it needs a larger role for government, and that in fact, if it's done well, what you're really talking about is leveling the playing field so that the renewables and other energy forms get a fair shake, because there are a lot of corporate subsidies right now that, uh, that are helping. We've been, as taxpayers across Canada, we've been subsidizing the growth in emissions from the Athabasca tar sands. And by the way, in 1996, the tar sands of Alberta produced a half a million barrels of oil a day. In 1996, Kreptan gave them a, a, a subsidy in the form of an accelerated capital cost allowance. And in that same year, Ralph Klein gave them the world's lowest royalty rates, 1% until they paid back all their capital costs. It's stunning. They're now Stelmac, and Alberta has now changed that for the first time. So we have in Canada subsidized the biggest single reason we haven't reached our Kyoto targets, the biggest single reason that we've had emissions increase as they have, because a barrel of oil out of the Athabasca tar sands takes a prodigious amount of energy to produce, as well as a lot of water. It's a terrible, ugly, nasty production there, and we're now at one, we've more than doubled the amount per day. We went from half a million barrels of oil a day in 96, we're down to 1.2 million barrels of oil a day, the Harper government wants us to bring it to 5 million barrels of oil a day, and they promised it all to the United States. So, and that's why they're talking about nuclear reactors in northern Alberta. The amount of energy you need to produce that 5 million barrels of oil a day, you need all the natural gas out of the Beaufort Sea down the Mackenzie Gas Pipeline that isn't built yet, and that won't be enough. So it's, 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 it's a, a really diabolical scheme. So cutting those subsidies, even Flaherty's budget this spring admitted those subsidies didn't make sense anymore, but they haven't removed them. They're saying they'll remove them over time and they'll give the industry lots of warning and anybody who's had an idea about a project that hasn't happened yet, if they had that idea while they were thinking about the subsidies, they still get the subsidies. So our program is we cut the subsidies to the production of fossil fuels, we cut the subsidies to the production of nuclear energy, we create, a, as you say, a more level playing field. The other thing we do is we use market signals. I mean, that's basically what a carbon tax is. It's a market signal. A cap and trade program is a market signal. And at the same time, we recognize that the so-called invisible hand of the marketplace isn't going to do it by itself. You need to have a, a minimum standard that no one can go below, and that's achieved through regulations. So that's why we need better fuel economy standards for automobiles. We need to ensure that the lighting and the refrigerators that are sold in Canada and the washing machines, all the large appliances can be more energy efficient we can make sure that the, that the worst of that category of energy wasting appliances is simply not available for sale. There are refrigerators for sale in Canada that are illegal in the United States because their regulations are better than ours. 
So there's a lot we can do, and it doesn't actually amount to a lot of actual government programs. It amounts to good policy and leadership, which then I actually, infer, I, I'm not worried about Canadian industry doing its fair share. Uh, there are a lot of companies that want to, and they're continually sabotaged by governments that say they're going to reach a target such as Kyoto. The companies that do the best job, that, that you know, kind of, uh, make their investments early, start taking it seriously to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and then the government doesn't follow through, well, then they are, in a competitive sense, undercut by the laggards who did nothing. So we've been consistently rewarding the worst companies and undercutting the ones that have been acting in a responsible fashion. And that's why I don't think industry will have any problem at all with the kind of program that the Green Party is, is proposing in this, in this policy document. And way in the corner back.